All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, tonight, our speaker is uh, Emiliana Simon-Thomas. She's the science director for the Greater Good Science Center here on UC Berkeley's campus, where she oversees the Expanding Gratitude Project. Emiliana earned her doctorate in cognition, brain, behavior at UC Berkeley. Uh, her dissertation used behavioral neuroscience methods to examine how negative states like fear and aversion influence thinking and decision making. Today, Emiliana's work spotlights the science that connects health and happiness to social affiliation, caregiving, and collaborative relationships as she continues to examine the potential for, as well as the benefits of, living a more meaningful life. Today, she's going to be talking to us about being happy as academics. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over. And I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for coming out. Oh, this one. Can you guys hear me in this mic? Is it working? OK. I wish I had some sort of telescope so I could see your faces. If anybody has the courage to come sit a little closer, I'd, be, uh, I'd welcome it. I understand if you want to sit back there, but I am kind of lonely up here. All right, let's see now. OK, so I'm Emiliana Simon-Thomas. Um, as Troy told you, I'm the science director at the Greater Good Science Center. The Greater Good is a center that was started about 12 years ago. It was originally called the Center for the Development of Peace and Well-Being. It was started by some wealthy donors who thought we need to do a little bit more to try to understand how to get people to flourish and how to help them get along. Like, where, where is that science and where is that information? And um, uh, today we've got a, a healthy smallish staff, but we're still doing the work, which is tracking the cutting edge science in these areas. We write about it on our website. We write articles. Um, we also have experts in the field write articles that are also featured on our site. If you haven't visited it, the greatergood.berkeley.edu, check it out. Um, we also have events where we have a whole day with a, with a particular expert in the field and people learn about their science and, and how particularly how to apply it. Um, Troy told you that I was running a project called Expanding Gratitude. And indeed, over the past five years, we've been trying to support and translate for the popular audience research that um, shows how beneficial gratitude can be for health and well-being. And this is a, an exciting and, and growing science. So why happiness? Um, well, frankly, um, Happiness got kind of some popular appeal in the past two or three years. And, and what we did recently was um, try to put all of our archived content over the years, our videos of experts, our, our writing, into a meaningful sort of 10-week massive open online course. And we were in this position of, well, what should we call this? We thought, well, we'll call it greater good science or you know, how to be more you know, invested or involved in the greater good. And we wanted this kind of humanistic, broader kind of language, but we also wanted a lot of people to see it and to go, yes, that's something I want. And it occurred to us that if we said the science of happiness, we would get a lot more of that. So we have focused now in a way that we hadn't before on this idea of happiness. But um, one of the things that you need to do or I need to do whenever I start to talk about happiness to a group of people is sort of come to some sort of understanding about what we mean about happiness. So. Um, this is a point where I ask, does anybody in here want to venture uh, to define happiness? What's someone's just, oh, you know, nothing official. I'm not going to say you're right or wrong. I'm just curious where you're at in terms of what, when you think of the word happy. Yeah. Happiness is being able to enjoy yourself even, though, even when you're having a bad day. Okay, I like that. And being able to enjoy yourself even when things aren't going your way or when you're having a bad day, yeah. Satisfaction in the moment. In the moment's a good part of that little expression. Anybody else? Being grateful for what you have. That's very similar and overlapping in ways with uh, satisfaction in the moment. Anybody else? What about money and pleasure and beauty? 
<laughs> all these things, success, achievement, right? All these things that our culture at some level sort of uh, teaches us or at least suggests is, is, is at the root of happiness. Um, I'm going to share with you a definition that is... I think a lot of people who study this would embrace. Uh, again, I'm not going to claim that this is the definitive you know, uh, consensus definition that everyone loves, but it's a reasonable one that many people would endorse. You know, happiness is the experience of joy, contentment, or positive well-being combined with a sense that one's life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. Okay? So a lot of what you guys already offered sort of falls, into, falls nicely into this description. Um, one thing I do want to say about happiness is that um, research suggests that it's not about pleasure and joy all the time. Okay? One who is happy, um, and, and I'm just going to talk for you a moment about sort of what historically people have thought happiness means. Um, my, one of my favorite kind of hit stories about the origins of, of happiness and people's thoughts about happiness comes from like most languages, most Western languages, where the, the prefix hap really means something close to luck or chance, right? Happenstance, right? Perhaps, right? It doesn't mean it's something I'm aspiring for and, and sort of trying to prioritize my life around experiencing or maximizing, right? It's really this, if it's in the stars, if you get the four-leaf clover, you might be happy. Um, the Greeks sort of thought about happiness in a different way. They had this kind of virtue or purpose sense of happiness, and Cicero famously said that if, you know, the person is being stretched out on the torture rack but has lived a good life, they're happy. Like it all, the thing that matters most is their sense of purpose and virtue. Um, Flo, which is the little surfing girl, is an interesting idea and, and probably relevant to those of you in this room because I can only assume that people who have pursued the academic path, graduate school, postdoc, um, have something of a relationship to the experience of flow. And flow is those times when you're so immersed in that, what you, that which you are doing, so involved and engaged and deeply sort of entertained by it that you sort of lose a sense of time. And, and, and it's kind of very energizing and motivating. A lot of times it's described in sort of athletic endeavors and things like you know, being out in beautiful parts of nature. But uh, I think for scientists who sometimes find themselves four hours later at the you know, edge of discovering the story behind their data, um, flow can be a really powerful experience. Um, achievement, pleasure, status, these are these things that we seek, right? We like pleasure, we're biologically wired to seek pleasures. The um, difficulty around pleasure is that we're also biologically wired to adapt to it, right? We, we get a piece of chocolate cake, it's delightful, it's delicious, someone brings us another, we're like, oh yeah, that's okay, I'll, I can eat a second. The third comes and you're like, no, I can, no thank you. The fourth comes and you're like, I'm going to be sick, right? Here's the same thing that was once extraordinarily pleasurable now becomes something very disgusting. So our, we're, 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 we're wired in such a way that those pleasures, and, and it's something to self-reflect on, and it goes for achievement too, right? Think of the moment before you had the postdoc that you have now and when you were hoping that you would get it and that this would come through for you. And the day it came through, how happy you were, and you shared it with your friends and family. And now today, do you still have that like <laughs> great sense of enthusiasm about it? Probably not. Right? You're pretty used to it. It's kind of where you are now. In fact, maybe you figured out reasons why it's not necessarily that satisfying and you wish you had something a little bit different, right? So we habituate, we adapt to these pleasures and, and achievements the last interesting and fun part of happiness is how much it relies on our sense of connection with other people. How much, it, um, how much our tendency towards kindness towards others has uh, an impact on our level of happiness day in and day out. How much our ability or our capacity to function in teams or to cooperate or collaborate really drives our day in and day out happiness. And it turns out most of the research would suggest, and I'm sorry again for this terrible pixelated Steph Curry picture. I don't know why it looks that way. But um, a lot of the research suggests that in any of these other domains, right, flow, achievement, pleasure, if you 
you want them to have a kind of sustainable impact on your happiness, there has to be a, a social element to them, right? Enjoying pleasures with another person is much more powerful than enjoying pleasures on your own, right? Having an achievement or, or having a purpose that feels like it's self-transcendent, it's beyond meeting your own needs, but in fact it's doing something for humanity is a much bigger boon to your happiness than... Um, aspiring for you know your own personal pleasure and wealth uh, in a, in a self-focused way. Um, there are some cultural differences, right? And I can see you see Berkeley is a wonderful place in that there are so many different people coming from different parts of the world. Um, it's an incredible strength intellectually and academically. But when we talk about happiness, there are some differences, and these are very broadly categorized between a sort of East Asian and, and European Western cultures. Um, uh, when, when you ask people, not scientists, you ask people what makes them happy or why they're happy, sort of like I asked you guys, but um, maybe people a little bit less expert or maybe a little bit less thoughtful, um, happiness is usually about these kind of high arousal, positive uh, em emotional moments like ah, enthusiasm, joy, right? These moments where everything just seems to be perfect and, and your, your body and mind feel just complete joy. Um, in the East Asian cultures, happiness seems to have a little bit more of a relational orientation. In fact, there are, are, there's, there's this idea that, that humility and being in the presence of somebody who's more powerful than you is, is, a, is a very pleasurable experience. And I think most of us in this room growing up in, in American culture don't have that experience, right? Uh, at least that's not how I felt when I'm around somebody who has more power than me. Um, so, you know, oh, sorry, I made beautiful little highlights and then didn't use them. <laughs> um, when we try to understand happiness scientifically, so I've given you kind of a definition. We've walked through kind of a philosophical, cultural discussion about how people think about happiness. And then let's talk about, well, let's look at people and understand what it is that makes people happy and how we can change whatever we're doing or or how we think or see the world to be happier ourselves. Um, in a very early study done by Ed Diener, um, what they did was measure happiness levels through a self-report questionnaire and then look at the lives of the people. And they figured out, well, turns out the people who always fall into the, who, who, who fall into this category, scratch always, people who fall into this category of very happy people always have a lot of uh, rich and deep personal friendships. They have friends who support them and whom they support, okay? And these are two kind of um, claims that came from this, this sort of pioneering early study, that social relationships, uh, they don't guarantee high happiness. It doesn't mean that you're going to be very happy just if you, have, uh, if, you, if you go out and try to make a bunch of new friends, but rather high happiness doesn't occur without them. Okay, so it's sort of like a necessary but not sufficient part of happiness. Um, another way to try to understand happiness is to look at people who, for one reason or another, um, fall into the category of very happy. And, and in this case, I'm, I'm talking about uh, Mathieu Ricard, and he's a Western-trained scientist who went to India and thought that perhaps a, a Buddhist spiritual path would be something that was more fulfilling, and in fact, he stuck with it, and he has, because of his scientific background, sort of lent himself to um, Richie Davidson, who runs the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin. And so what, why, why I show you him is that Richie said, well, let's measure this guy. Let's see what's going on in his brain and, and how it might be different. Um, he also did a study not too different from Ed Diener's, except looked at brain activation rather than just life, life circumstances and, um, and, and happiness ratings. And what Richie showed was that when people are score higher on the happiness sort of range, they tend to show a pattern of, of hemispheric dominance that, um, that is unusual. In other words, they, their left hemisphere in a moment of kind of resting, not being asked to do anything, is more involved in kind of driving conscious experience than their right hemisphere. Um, and the reason I show you Matthew Ricard was because when he measured that same thing in him, uh, his ratio of left to right activation was off the charts, and Time magazine deemed him the happiest man alive. So, you know, there, there are interesting ways to try to understand um, 
what, where happiness might be coming from. Other studies that tried to look at undergrads and ask sort of, um, what are you doing and how happy are you when you're doing those things? And what you're looking at is kind of a happiness z-score. And interestingly, the, the highest value is this 0.35 where people are talking with friends. So talking with your friends is this thing that in the moment is associated with the highest ratings of happiness. And so this is like a, a present moment question rather than a retrospective or a self-report that's more general about who you are. On the right, I'm showing you some data from a more recent study done by my friend Matt Killingsworth. Matt Killingsworth developed an app called Track Your Happiness. And what the app does is basically ping you throughout the day, much like this study, um, except it's not just with undergrads and it's not as part of a, of a, of a, of a laboratory experiment. Um, it's real life. He asks, what are you doing? Who are you with? Are you talking to them? Uh, are you paying attention to what you're doing, and how do you feel? Okay, and then these big bubbles are uh, sort of how many people, the magnitude of the population who say, who, who, who give the rating along this 35 to 95 of, of happiness, with 35 being lowest and 95 being highest. And first, let's look at the top half. People don't necessarily, a lot of people don't necessarily rate rest and sleep as, as, as particularly high on the happiness. Working, pretty low. Being on your home computer, pretty low. Um, I'm not sure how he got people to answer this question, but <laughs> evidently, uh, intimate relations is something that scores high on the happiness chart. The second half of this plot on the bottom is really interesting and pertains to what the young woman in, in red said earlier, which is um, feeling good in the moment. Um, one of the questions Matt asks, or not him, but his app asks is, are you thinking about what you're doing or are you thinking about something else? And he calls thinking about something else mind wandering. And he thinks about what you're doing as not mind wandering. And if you're thinking about something else, he asks further, are you thinking about something else fun? Like, are you sort of fantasizing about your vacation that you're going to take in a week? Or are you thinking about something unpleasant, like how badly you fear you're going to do on your exam, or how crappy your analysis turned out when you thought it was going to be really good, or how much you think people might not like you, or, or, or things like that. And it turns out when people are engaged in the thing I just sort of tried to exemplify, um, they're, they're rating themselves as pretty unhappy, OK? Um, when people are mind wandering about sort of nothing in particular that may, you know, does not, not something that is happy or sad or good or bad, they're still less happy than the kind of median here. And when people are pleasantly mind wandering, it's, it's not necessarily a disservice to their well-being. But when people are not mind wandering at all, in other words, when they're present, when they're paying attention to what they're doing right then and there, you're going to have the most um, robust experience of, of pleasantness, of happiness, of, of goodness in that moment. So the take home is one, these things down here tend to be more social. These things up here tend to be less social. And these things over here are not present, right? Not focusing on what you're doing. And these things, uh, with the exception of the pleasant mind wandering, um, are, 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 are focused, right? Are, are focused on the present moment, are, are being present in what you're doing. I don't know why I'm showing it. So then the question is, is based on these sort of simple observations about happiness, what kinds of things feed into it, um, where it's coming from, what kinds of qualities people have, is there a possibility that people can change their happiness levels? And there's a lot of kind of rumors and ideas about that from the extreme of no, you know, I'm genetically, biologically who I am, and this is just you know, take me or leave me, um, to the sort of very far extreme you know, neuroplasticity, we can become whoever we want by doing whatever we want. And, and um, both of those are probably a little bit wrong. You know, we're somewhere closer to the middle. But let's look through our kind of components of, of, of contributing to happiness and see how any of those can change. So can your luck change? Can you do something about your genetics or your biology? Um, probably not, right? Not much you can do there. Eh. Let me just back that up a little bit or reverse my statement a little bit. If you look at some of the epigenetic studies recently that are showing that people who are 
more lonely in life suffer sort of hyperinflammation as a result of, of, of gene expression. Um, perhaps being less lonely could be something that uh, one could, could do to affect the way that their genes are expressing. Um, virtue, purpose, flow, sure, right? You can sort of change some idea or philosophical outlook or some habit or, or, or vision about how people are, how you are, what, what, what's possible. Um, and, and you can try to design your schedule so that you have more opportunity for experiences of flow, which you know uh, are, are correlated with happiness. Um, pleasure, status, achievement, yeah, sure. You can organize your life to experience more pleasure. You can uh, try to buy more things that you think are going to bring you pleasure. You can uh, work really hard to gain status. But as we talked about before, it's not something that lasts for a long time, right? These are kind of short bursts that, yeah, they're great when they're there, but they're not something that's going to carry you through for the long term. So in the end, it's a little bit of a circu circle, you know, circuitous effort. It's not really going to end up with some sustainable long-term change in happiness. Um, can you do something in your life to broaden, strengthen, make more authentic your sense of friendship and community? Uh, can you uh, behave in ways that um, make it easier or, or cultivate a greater habit in, 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 in supporting or lending some of your effort to the well-being of others? For sure, right? We're all probably thinking a little bit about what's happening in Nepal, and thinking, well, what can we do? And reading little posts that say, well, you should not go there because you're just useless. You don't know what to do, but just give money. Or you should go there because they need your you know, face-to-face -face support. And everybody needs to think in different ways about what they're capable of. And sometimes it's just the honest-to-goodness, heartfelt concern extended towards other people that is sufficient for being a person who cares in the world. Right? I think a lot of us are worried that, well, caring means I have to actually fix the problem or solve it. We can't all do that all the time, but still caring and not sort of suppressing or squishing that care is an important part of it. Okay, so what did we do? We put all of our material up into a class called The Science of Happiness. Um, it was partly the kinds of things I've been talking about, studies, figures, you know, claims about what these... Uh, what, what these uh, researchers just discovered. And then it was partly a very applied experience. So we taught about sort of cooperation. And then we, we, we gave some specific instructions for how to reconcile conflict, right? That's something we're not necessarily always that good at. And, and depending on who your parents were and what your life experience it was, maybe you find rather challenging. You know, are you someone who forgives easily? Are you someone who apologizes easily? Turns out when you do forgive, it's good for you and the other person by like leagues, leaps and bounds, right? Apologizing makes conflict go away so much faster than if you sort of hold your ground and stalwart and stay defensive about something. Um, being in conflict, being in social conflict is fundamentally stressful. So, um, this is just a little infographic that kind of represents a, a subset of the practices that we suggested people do on, in, while they were in this Science of Happiness class. Three good things, mindful breathing, write a gratitude letter, commit random acts of kindness, uh, strengthen your capacity to be an active listener. And these are all practices that come from research studies. We're not just making these up. We're not just sitting around going, oh, how can we make someone nicer? We're reading what people like Sonia Lubomirsky are doing, people like Bob Emmons, where they're bringing people into a room. They're saying, do this for six days, and they have another group coming into the room and saying, do something different for six days, and the ones that do these practices show gains in their well-being, health, and happiness. So... Um, we had a few more, and I just throw this up there to flesh out the list, Apology and Forgiveness, which I mentioned. There's this whole uh, week that we spend talking about the way people think, think about themselves and some of the practices that can make people kinder to themselves. Um, Kristen Neff was actually a graduate student here at UC Berkeley in psychology, and in her graduate school experience, she felt just deeply stressed and troubled and uh, at some point came upon some kind of experience where compassion was the topic of discussion. And then this idea of self-compassion arose in her mind. Like, I think that part of my problem, this is me being Kristen Neff, is that I'm so hard on myself. 
Like if my friend fails, I go, hey, you know, it's okay. Everything's going to be fine. It's going to work out. And um, you're a great person. Those are the kinds of things we say to our friends or our family members or even someone we don't know that well when things go bad. But when we fail, we go into like this total destructive mode of, oh my God, I'm inadequate. I'm not actually good enough to do this. I'm an imposter. I'm, I'm a loser. Nothing's ever going to work out. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but I would ask you, to, for a moment, entertain considering what actually does go in, on in your mind when you experience failure and how, what kind of self-talk happens, what kinds of ways do you sort of judge and treat yourself, and, and how would it seem if you talk to someone else that way? It would be pretty hostile. So her whole sort of system, her whole, her whole thesis is that self-compassion, sort of treating yourself in the, in the kind way that you would treat somebody else, is, uh, is, is an important part of happiness. Um, Dacher Keltner, who is my colleague and co-instructor for the course, is doing this really wonderful cutting edge research on awe, right? Awe, this, this, this emotional experience that happens when we're in the presence of something much bigger than ourselves, something that sort of challenges our ex expectations about the world. Turns out, bring students into the eucalyptus grove over by the life sciences building and you have them look up at the trees for a minute and you have another group look up at the building for a minute and then you ask some questions afterwards. The ones who looked up in the trees are more generous, more cooperative. You ask them how much money they want on a sliding scale, they ask for less, right? They're just much more generous and humble in the wake of this experience of awe. And it's just, it's, it's a fun and interesting uh, new, new territory. Um, so we wanted to know, of course, were we having any impact, right? We're teaching these people the science. We're teaching people these skills, these specific practices, and asking them to do them. And we then also asked them once a week to check in. And we said, look at each of these faces. And we got a, an illustrator from Pixar to draw these for us based on Darwin's descriptions of the facial configuration of, of sort of some universal human emotions. And uh, we asked this question, right? To what extent does each one of these, and we didn't show them all at once, is this one first or whatever random order they appeared in each week. And um, they said, lately, not at all to very much, right? And, and what we wanted to do was map out, you know, did there, a person's sort of relative frequency of the more positive emotions, and this one's supposed to be kind of like a tender, loving expression. This is an amused expression. This is sort of an interested, you know, expression. Or these more um, destructive emotional states, right? Fear, anger, sadness. Um, does, the, does the sort of relative uh, frequency of each of these change as a result of, of being in the course? And um, these are the mean scores across the students from week one to week 10. So we're showing this like measurable quantitative increase in people's uh, willingness to say that they felt these good positive things that are kind of more pro-social Pro-social means that sort of uh, concern with the well-being or the, the, the wellness of, of, the, of another person versus, and, and, and a relative decrease in the uh, kinds of emotions that, that aren't characteristic of happiness. So don't, you don't usually say you're feeling angry and happy at the same time. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we calculated one number based on the, you know, we, we, the sum of the positive emotions minus the sum of the negative emotions, and then we sort of normalized it to fall on a zero to one uh, scale so that it would fit into the course progress bar along with people's, you know, problem sets and exam scores. So it looks like a 60 and, you know, not a four or something that doesn't, doesn't scale the same way. So great question. Just a little mathematical transformation. Um, we also asked people to go to a, um, uh, a link and fill out some surveys that are standard happiness questionnaires in the psychology literature. And what you're looking at is subjective happiness. And here's an example of the kind of questions you might see. In general, I consider myself not to a very happy person. Um, the first 4.45 bar is before the course. The 5.1 is after. And the 5.11 is three months later. So we pinged them three months later just to see, like, okay, so people did this. Now they feel like happiness is valuable. Are they just saying it? Um, or is this something that we can count on as kind of a lasting impact? 
Um, we asked them about uh, psychological well-being, and, and we used a subscale that was called the flourishing scale. I'm a good person and live a good life. In significant increases again. Uh, we also asked about stress, which went down over the course of before and after the course, and then stayed down three months later. And we asked about loneliness. So um, we felt pretty good, like you know, just teaching people that happiness matters, giving them a sense of what happiness is, explaining that happiness has a whole lot to do with skills that make you more able to connect with other people and reconcile in conflict and re recover from your own difficulties um, actually changes people's feelings about their own happiness. Yeah? So, two questions. Yeah. If you have a control group, and what do you think is the placebo effect here? I think the placebo effect, great question. Absolutely, we don't have a control group because we don't, this is not a randomized controlled trial. This is a free, this, you know, free open class that anybody can register for on the edX platform, and it's very self-selected. People who said, I want to take the science of happiness instead of you know, coding in Python or whatever other, you know, there's a lot of options. Um, and then uh, this also reflects who sort of is, who stayed in the class, right? I mean, there's, we, we got 115,000 people register in our first launch in the fall of 2014. We had about 7,000 people finish. And that is actually good for a MOOC. It's not a bad ratio of, of starting to finishing. There's a lot of things that need to change to make massive open online courses more successful across the board, and we're, we're hoping that we can sort of stay with that. Um, so yeah, there is no control condition. I, we tried. We tried to see if we got people who did the surveys before and after but just didn't do anything in the course. But um, there, the numbers of people who were like that were very, very small. People, if they dropped off, they didn't come back and do the post-course survey. So. Um, placebo effect, <sighs> I mean, we're not giving people a drug, you know, we're, we're, we're explaining something about an idea and people are either endorsing it or not endorsing it. So, you know, when someone changes their attitude as a result of a new piece of knowledge or someone tries something, like apologizing, and then feels better after they apologize. I don't know. I mean, it's a great question. I, you know, in, in a funny way, why not the placebo? Right? Why not? If, if, if it's an idea that this is good for me and this will work, and it, and it makes a person happier, I would take that over, you know, smoking cannabis twice a day. Well, the only the, that could be true, except that it's three months later, and they've been doing nothing in, related to the course for those three months. Like we don't know if they, you know, they haven't been. All of these practices would prefer to have been done for like eight weeks themselves. Like think about the mindfulness in you know practice. Many many people say, oh, you want to try meditation or mindfulness? Well, you need to take this five day silent vipassana retreat, right? We're saying, hey, look, we're giving you this MP3 for three minutes of mindful breathing, and that might be the only thing a person does. So. You know, I, I don't know. It, it, it's something I'd love to study. We can't really do an RCT, but I think in, we, we're, we're trying to work with other instructors to have a comparison group so we can get someone, people who took a different class entirely to take our pre-post uh, surveys and, and see if they change in different ways or don't change at all. So it's, it's a great question. Um, a couple others, sorry. We asked people how satisfied they were with their life, went up, stayed up. We asked people this funny survey that I really like because it's not just questions and language uh, or you know, ideas in this verbal way, but rather this pictorial thing of when you think about yourself and other people in the world, how do you think about yourself? And you know, how similar are you to other people? Or how much how kind of common humanity do you have? And um, over the course of before and after, people rated themselves as having more of a sense of overlap with other people in the world than they did before having started the course. Yeah? How applicable do you think results would be for like a general population in the United States to not consider ourselves a blessing? You know, our, our student body, as far as I can tell, was different than our usual audience for the Greater Good Science Center. Usually we are, are the, the, the brunt of our audience are sort of well-educated, 
50, 40 to 55 year old women. That's who's, who are really drawn to coming to our website and reading articles. With the MOOC, we were, I was really excited about the possibility that we would reach a whole different demographic, and we did. And there's a lot of people in this course who are in their 20s, and there's also people in their 70s. Um, I, you know, I'm going to show you next. Let, let, me, let me see if any of this answers your question. And I'm just going to walk through some testimonials here that we got on our, on our sort of follow-up survey. After we asked all the regular survey questions, we said, you know, do you have anything you want to tell us? And these are obviously cherry-picked for ones that are very powerful, but there were very few that said anything um, hostile or like this was a waste of my time. We just didn't. The, the only one <laughs> that I remember was a question. One of our questions was, what could we do to improve this class? And one person wrote, less videos of Emiliana. So we'll see if we can do something about that one. <laughs> But other than that, um, let's just look through these and then see if that gives you some, I don't know, some, some sense about how universal or how applicable this is to the general population. And you can tell by some of the language here that these aren't native English speakers, right? The long one, sorry, this one just came in actually yesterday. Someone spontaneously emailed it to us. Okay, so that was sort of a shameless <laughs> appeal to your emotions and uh, connecting with just random people in the class who, who share their feelings and thoughts about how its potential and its impact on them. Um, my feeling is that it, there, there is no selection here. If, if somebody is interested, I don't think you could force this material on someone. I don't think you could say this is required of you, you have to do it. Um, but I do think if somebody wants to try, then, uh, then, it, then it's likely to, to, to provide some significant measurable benefit. Um, I'm losing track of time because I don't have a clock in here. So um, is, it, is it 6.40? Is that what time it is? And I have till 7? OK, great. I'm doing OK. So um, can I change my happiness? This is the average person, right? Not the person necessarily who already is interested in these ideas, who already thinks about common humanity, who already says, who already has the random acts of kindness sticker, bumper sticker on their car. What is it that I could do? Um, you know, one of the first things, and I just spoke last Friday at the California Psychological Association's uh, convention in San Diego, and they wanted me to spend the whole time talking about mindfulness. And... Um, I was glad to do that because in many ways, mindfulness is sort of a launching point, right, for, for thinking about, well, maybe I don't want to change my happiness because I don't really have a hold or have much purchase on how happy I am. Like, I'm just kind of going through the motions. I'm, I got my schedule laid out. Here's what I do each day. I don't know if I feel good or bad. I don't really think about it. Yeah, some moments are pleasant and some moments are very frustrating, but, you know, am I happy? I don't know. Right? So I think that the first sort of enterprise in thinking this through, if it does appeal to you, is, well, are you happy? Do you feel like, in general, you have an easy time and readily feel positive emotions like gratitude or compassion or affection or enjoyment or laughter? Right? Do, you, do those come to you pretty, pretty easily? And when you do suffer difficult moments, do they stick for a long time, or do you kind of recover from them quickly? 
The science of emotions suggests that emotions shouldn't last very long. They're pretty quick little kind of indicator processes. You know, you feel um, a sense of affiliation and it changes your motivation to approach somebody. You feel a sense of anger and it changes your physiology and your motivation to sort of resolve a problem or something that's blocking your goals or um, to deal with something that is perhaps challenging you in a way that's, that's frustrating. It's not supposed to be anger for an hour, right? Anger kind of happens and then you use it to go resolve the injustice, deal with it. Um, so the question is, is, do you have that? Do you have a sense of meaning and purpose, right? And if you don't, right, if you're sort of questioning yourself, that's a really neat place to start, right? Look in, introspect, watch your mind, see how present you are day in and day out, see how easy it is to be joyful, how, easy, how easily you feel sort of affection and kindness towards other people versus jealousy, frustration, irritation, these other kind of really easy habits that we develop in our lives as a consequence of whatever's happened, right? Whatever, whatever may, perhaps it's how our parents behaved or perhaps it's, you know, any number of other things that can sort of stick into these habits for how we behave. So the first step really is kind of looking inward and seeing where we're starting from. And when we, when we have that kind of basis, okay, now I know I'm not very forgiving. I'm kind of angry, and I stay angry for a long time. And I'm afraid to forgive people because it's going to challenge my sense of strength or who I am. So think about that and then look at the science and go, huh, maybe it's better if I just sort of try this, even if it's really hard. Right? Let's just try forgiving someone and then see that it's beneficial, that it does lead to uh, an improvement in my, in my well-being. And then you can let the kind of natural reinforcement process happen. When, so when you do something and it ends up being pleasurable, it's a lot easier to do it the second time. Um, so I think a lot of people wish that there wasn't any sort of effort or work that had to happen, that, you know, I want to be happier. Maybe it's just going to be when I get married to that beautiful person or when I have my first child or when I buy my first house or when I buy my first vacation house. Like we have these sort of landmark milestones that we think, well, just on that day, I'm going to be happy, right? Or, or when I finally get tenure, I'm going to be happy, right? I'll be able to relax and be happy, right? And, and again, I think, I have hope that I've convinced you at some level that no, the day you get tenure, you will be happy that day, but a week, two weeks, three months later, you're going to be just the same way that you are today. Like, it doesn't, do, it doesn't help you to have reached that level of achievement, right? People often think, if I just had another $30,000 to pay off this debt that I've accrued over my, you know, pursuit of education, I would be happy. It's just not true. Other things filter in, and, 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 and people tend to maintain the same set point unless they sort of change something more deep about how they see the world who they interact with, and how their meaning is tied to something that's self-transcendent. Um, there's this hope that uh, we can, our behaviors or these actions or these changes and how we relate to people day in and day out, um, that, that we can kind of immediately feel happier. Right? And, and actually, there's some really interesting research coming out of Berkeley looking at the difference between kind of pursuing happiness and sort of prioritizing your life for the kinds of experiences that give rise to happiness. Because that first thing, pursuing happiness, ironically and paradoxically, is deleterious to happiness. Okay? Having this idea, I'm going to get happier and I'm doing these things to be happier, and wait a minute, today I'm not happier than I was yesterday, even though I did these things, damn it, right? That is not good for happiness. Or I'm trying to be happy, as happy as her, and she's happier than me all the time, even though I'm trying to be happy. Social comparison, really bad for happiness, right? So this idea that you should pursue happiness and try to strive for it is actually something to avoid. Rather, understanding what it is in your life that actually makes you happy and then trying to schedule or organize your time and your experiences so that you have those kinds of experiences, so you have moments of flow, so that you spend time with people that you feel happy around, that, that you feel supported and connected with, right? So that you go out into nature and experience awe with other people, so that you're mindful and present in the moments of your day in and day out experience. Doing that kind of stuff, 
does boost happiness. But thinking, I just want to be happier, and trying to strive in that way actually isn't necessarily happy. So uh, I just want to kind of give you a little bit of some of the biology and scientific thinking behind why some of these practices might actually change something about your experience day in and day out. And I'm gonna, this is a little bit loose. Um, this isn't a perfect scientific statement, but is kind of a, well, we know what kinds of psychological things happen when you do something like three good things or random acts of kindness. And we know from some studies that have encouraged people to be charitable or to support others that what happens is that we upregulate dopamine reward circuitry. Okay, so that when there's, there's a, a science publication in 2009 by William Harbaugh at University of Oregon where he made people, and this is kind of what, I don't know, what's been like two weeks since we all paid taxes, unless you all paid them way earlier. <laughs> um, uh, people who had to, it was mandatory, they had to pay part of what they earned while they were doing this little computer game inside of a brain scanner. Um, actually showed reward, activation in their reward circuits when they were giving money to, uh, to, to others that was very similar to the reward activation they showed when they were earning money themselves. Um, other studies uh, on cooperation have shown that when you win a game and you get $10, that's the sort of amount, um, you have a certain level of reward activation. This is the nucleus accumbens sort of, sort of bubbling up in, in, in dopamine. Um, that's great. If you win that same amount, $10, by playing a game cooperatively, you win 10 and somebody else wins 10 and you guys have, have, have cooperated in order to win and earn that $10, you have a stronger engagement of that reward circuitry. So these behaviors, there's this kind of like bottom-up approach. If you just go out and do things, even if they don't necessarily come naturally, like um, and the three good things is really just a, a, an exercise in appreciation and positive emotional experience. Like just reflecting on the good things in your life sort of just gets your goodness processing biological systems to work more. And as they work more, they become more, the threshold for them working on a, any given moment is lower, and so they're more likely to work. Um, warm glow experiences, once again, uh, are these moments where you actually feel something warm and pleasurable in the moment of providing support to someone else. There's a wonderful study from UCLA. Naomi Eisenberger and Tristan Inagaki put people into a scanner. Um, their partner was outside of the scanner. The person in the scanner got to hold on to the partner outside of the scanner's arm. The fingers of the person whose arm was being held were, was getting shocked at a painful level. And the person in the scanner was told, well, you can like, hold their arm in a way that is like supportive. Like, I'm here. I know you're getting shocked, and I'm supporting you. Or you can hold their arm just kind of passively, or you can hold onto a ball. And what they showed was that that support lending arm holding experience, again, they tried to control for the physical you know, uh, sensations. The support holding was associated uniquely with activation and the reward circuitry. So giving other people support, knowing that we're contributing to the well-being of others, activates our reward circuitry. So that's one idea. Oh, this is another really fun body of work. Elizabeth Dunn, Mike Norton. This is related to the article that I gave Troy and suggested that you guys read. I don't know if anybody did, but it's a really neat body of work that looks at how sort of the extent to which you give to others has a systematic influence on your sense of well-being. And around the world, what they've done is, is looked at the relationship between pro-social pro spending and well-being. And um, pretty much everywhere you look, except for a few countries where there's probably some significant suffering as a consequence of strife and war or other challenges to human comfort, um, there's a positive relationship. Okay, the more people spend on others, the more they commit some of their own resources to other people, the better off they are okay, around the world. The original study was, was Elizabeth Dunn taking you, you half of the room, you get $20. You half of the room, you get $20. I'm going to test your happiness before you do anything. You go spend it on yourself. You go spend it on other people. Come back, test your happiness again. The ones who spend it on other people are systematically happier than the people who went out and spent that $20 on themselves. So these are ideas that we don't like think of because we're 
watching things and hearing stories about how great it is to accumulate lots and lots of wealth and resources for ourselves, right? And we're not being given these same narratives about how important it is to be generous and share what you have and, and invest in the welfare of others. Um, Active listening, apology, and forgiveness. These all, these practices all really tap into these basic systems we have that are dedicated to empathizing, right? To feeling something when somebody else is emoting or expressing towards us, right? We have dedicated systems in our insula, in our midline uh, between the hemispheres, the cortex sitting between the hemispheres that is really sensitive to experiences that are that are sort of solicited by other people. Like we're, we're dedicated. Parts of our nervous system are dedicated to that. We also have areas in our higher cortex, um, the temporal parietal junction, and Rebecca Sachs has kind of pioneered this work that is dedicated to social understanding. So there's one area that's involved in I feel something bio, like physically when, when you emote in my presence. Like I feel something too. And the other area is, well, what does it mean? And, and why are you feeling that way? And Historically in my life, when people have expressed anger in my direction, it's usually meant that you know, their, their, their goals have been blocked or, or something unfair or unjust is happening. And so I'm going to assume that you're feeling something unjust has happened to you. And I'm going to ask you questions that reflect that assumption. Okay, so we have cortex dedicated to being experts in understanding other people's perspectives and being sensitive to the signals that other people sort of uh, convey in our direction. And as we use these sorts of practices, um, we're really kind of exercising those systems, right? We're, we're getting those systems, we're bringing them online, we're using them. We're using them uh, in, at the expense of other systems that we might habitually use. And, and um, you know, our nervous system is a, is a limited resource system. We can only pay attention to a certain number of things at once. And if we're really paying attention to another person and, and you know, focused on what they're saying, we're way less likely to be mind-wandering about the you know, frustrating concerns that might be happening in our own lives, a, a kind of activity that is uh, associated with reductions in happiness. So again, we're kind of just driving the um, the... the orientation and utilization of our resources in a way that's more beneficial. Okay. I think I will finish on time. Um, the vagus nerve. So Dacker Keltner, again, my co-instructor, has also, and, and I together, have done work looking at how the vagus nerve relates to happiness, to being pro-social, to contentment. Vagus nerve is our 10th cranial nerve. It's got these uh, sort of processes that go all over the body. Um, the one that we, we're best at measuring at is, is number four, and it is the mechanism of parasympathetic influence on the heart. So your heart rate beats at a certain kind of regular pace or rate, um, and that's a consequence of your sympathetic nervous system sort of telling your heart to beat fast and your parasympathetic nervous system telling your heart to beat slow. And it's this kind of constant balance between them. And your vagus nerve is the thing that's saying beat slow. And it's particularly involved in your heart rate while you're exhaling. Okay? So it's interesting when you think about things like yoga or some kind of contemplative practice or mindfulness or meditation where so often the focus is on the breath, right? Really noticing breath going into your body and really noticing breath going out. Turns out if you're breathing out slower than you're breathing in, you're kind of, you're, you're engaging your vagus nerve. Turns out if your vagus nerve is uh, flexible and adaptive, meaning it can kind of come on and slow things down, but also sort of, uh, sort of back off and, and let your heart rate speed up at the appropriate moments. There's all kinds of health advantages to that, including a sense of psychological well-being. Okay, people with higher vagus nerve. Here's another crazy study. Dacker shows videos of people talking and asks people to watch them and turns off the sound, so all you see is their face talking in their mouth, and he asks the watchers, how much would you want to like, go get a coffee with that person, right? And systematically, people watching the videos want to go get a coffee with the people who are speaking who have higher vagal tone, right? Whose vagus nerves are stronger. So again, 
Another way that uh, sort of connecting with other people, Steve Porges, this is another quick little snippet. Um, Steve Porges uh, called the Vegas, or developed something called the polyvagal theory and suggested that all of these sort of processes from this one that sort of helps control the movement of our, of our vocal apparatus so that we can intonate in meaningful ways, um, that they're all actually in a, some kind of symbiotic way supporting our affiliative motivations. So, um, and, and in fact, again, people who have higher vagal tone are more affiliative. Finally, I'm just going to quickly allude to the fact that there is a, a, a cir circuits in our brain that are completely dedicated to caregiving and nurturance, typically implicated in rodent and primate studies of maternal care. So if you knock these out, then the, the, the moms don't care for their offspring anymore. In humans, we can't do those kinds of research studies, but what we do know is that this field of, of research on attachment status, so attachment, secure attachment means that you've ended up in a situation where you feel like you can trust and you feel safe in the world because of how your parents treated you. They were there, they, 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 your life was predictable, you weren't harmed in unexpected ways. People who are securely attached have relationship advantages throughout their lives. They're easier uh, to work with, they make better friends, they're more connected to their communities. So again, these basic care nurturance systems that speak in the language of oxytocin, right? Oxytocin is what's kind of pulsing, pulsating through this area. Um, they become strengthened or more likely to be engaged through these sorts of uh, deeper um, interpersonal practices. Uh, mindful breathing, um, I'll, I'll spare you the details here, but essentially what you're looking at is um, the extent to which mindfulness or contemplative practice or you know, inner reflection can be a stress buffering kind of enterprise. The more you do it, the better you get at handling and recovering from stressful experiences. That's basically what the science knows now. There are all kinds of other claims about mindfulness and what it can help with, but really when you look deeply at the literature and, and, and try to find only RCTs, um, the, the, the systematic effect is that, yes, mindfulness buffers stress. People feel less stressed about things that are going wrong in their life when they uh, have either become, they either for some reason are mindful or score well on a mindfulness questionnaire or do some kind of specific mindfulness or contemplative training. Um, oh, I wanted to show you this little video. This is kind of a fun one about what gratitude and awe seem to combat. Let's see if it works. Oh. Oh, I don't know. Oh, sorry. I don't know if I can get it to work. I actually don't think I even plugged in the sound, but I could. Let's see. Oh, let's see if it'll go. Yeah. The standard, the high standard on the airplane. That's yes. the newest thing that I know exists. And I'm sitting on the plane. They go over on the laptop. I'm going on the internet. It's fast, and I'm watching YouTube clips. I'm in an airplane. And then it breaks down. And they apologize to you that's not working there. So you go, this is bull. <laughs> but like, how quickly the world owes him something yes. he knew existed only 10 seconds ago. So anyway, I'm, 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 I'm a, a minute over time, but I just wanted to use that example because it so nicely articulates the attitudes that people can end up with habitually um, that something like gratitude and awe can really kind of get in the way of. When you're experiencing gratitude or you're practicing gratitude, you're thinking of your life in a more grateful way, you don't have that sense of entitlement, right? They don't happen together. Um, this is, uh, I kind of told you about this study already. Um, this is when we put people into the, uh, into the Redwoods, what they, how they reported um, their, their levels of, of generosity and their sense of, of self as being something less powerful uh, was, was, um, was increased in the, in the awe condition compared to just looking up at a building. Um, quick, quick pitfalls. Sorry, this is my last slide. Um, number one, this idea that you can't change. Indeed, you are a person who has some constraints to how much 
you know, malleability there is, but there's a tremendous amount of malleability that, that people can discover by, um, by practicing uh, behaviors that are different from what they've already gotten used to or just adopting a new perspective on things. Number two, this idea that um, we can just go off and do it on ourselves or by ourselves and, and we only have to worry about ourselves. Um, this, this tends to be a little bit problematic. Um, we've already talked about this kind of um, uh, grass is always greener, right, when we're, we're worried about how what we have now isn't good enough because somebody else has something better and you get something really good and then you see someone else has something better and then your thing isn't good anymore. These kinds of social comparisons are really harmful and get in the way of your capacity for joy. Um, and fear of missing out. Um, I think this is one of the criticisms that people have about spending time on Facebook. You see everybody else's fun times and you feel like, oh, my life is not that fun. And it's really important in those moments to avoid that train of thought because it is destructive and, and not really meaningful and it's a kind of mind wandering. So um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it and I'm happy to hang out and answer any questions if people have more. <laughs>